Greetings guys, gals, non-binary pals, and welcome back to another video. Today, I couldn't remember how to braid hair. I've been braiding my hair every day for the past few days, and this morning it didn't work for me. So I have pigtails that tried to be braids, and I don't know how I feel about it. Today's video is another episode of Dear Kiwi, which is a series where I present to you a topic and then you send me your emails relating to said topic. And we sit down, we read through some emails and we have a chat about them. And I have really enjoyed doing this. I'm having a great time. It's really nice to do something that is a bit more personal than like going through Reddit and Twitter and TikTok and stuff. So I'm enjoying it. I hope that you are as well. And today's Dear Kiwi episode is internet support group because I remember being like, 13 and Dan is not on fire at the time doing his internet support group and I loved it. I was obsessed with it, it was my favorite thing ever and he hasn't done it for like a decade now. So someone has to step up, you know? And that's me just because I felt like it. <laughs> so a couple weeks ago, I got you to send me some like concerns and things that you had in your life and I'm going to sit and I'm gonna try to offer whatever advice that I can. But before we get into it, I would like to present the next topic for my next Dear Kiwi episode, which is going to be parents. <laughs> and just like your stories of parents, like shit your parents do that is just kind of absolutely ridiculous, like strict rules or ridiculous things they've said or done. Kind of like going through like the r slash insane parents Reddit or all the like toxic boy mom kind of vibe, you know? Send me your story. And together we can look through and experience parental trauma together. Please send them to dearkiwi at gmail.com. That is kiwi with a Q. And I look forward to reading through them. Also, before we get into it, I would like to say a massive thank you to today's patron of the day, Alexia. I appreciate you and your support so much. And I hope that you enjoy this video. If anyone else would like to become a patron, go to patreon.com slash savvycat. Starts at as little as one pound a month and I appreciate it greatly. I'm in the process of discovering myself and my sexuality, but there are some things that I am unsure of. I am a cisgender man, but I have never really assigned myself a label regarding sexuality. For as long as I remember, I have known that I am attracted to women. I'm also attracted to non-binary people as well. Well, a few months ago, I developed a crush on two people that happened to be guys. It's interesting because it feels like this was the first time I crushed on a guy because until this point in time, I can only seem to remember crushing on girls. There was even one time in 2018 where I couldn't bring myself to kiss another guy while we both performed in a short play. He couldn't either. To this day, I still have a preference for girls and I only feel like I like a specific type of boy, generally more feminine boys. This has me wondering, could I be bisexual if the label fits? I also wonder what may have happened in 2018, as well as when or if I will ever get another guy crush. Sexuality is such a fluid, ever-changing, ever-growing thing. And I think that that is first and foremost, the most important thing for everyone to acknowledge. You don't really need to be 100% certain because it could change. Like you say, like back in 2018, you didn't think you had any interest in guys. And then all of a sudden, here you are crushing on a guy. And I think it's important for you to know that like, you don't need to know. You don't need to be certain and you don't need to have a label if a label doesn't feel like it fits you. Like myself, I don't use a label. I use queer because queer is the label for not having a label, I suppose. I didn't even use queer until 2020. I had dated a guy, I had dated a girl and I was still like, I just, am i'm just i'm just savannah that's it there's no nothing else because no words really ever felt like they fit and then i started using queer in 2020 literally purely because i thought queer kiwi sounded cool like i changed my tiktok name to the queer kiwi just because i was like that kind of sounds cool <laughs> and then in doing that queer became my identity. Like the queer Kiwi genuinely is actually what gave me my queer identity, which is so funny because you would absolutely expect it to be the other way around. My point being, although my sexuality like fits the definition of like pansexual, that's not a label that I've ever really felt fits me because it always feels too restrictive. Labels for me just feel very restrictive and definitive. 
And if that is something that you are also struggling with or you don't wanna pick a label out of fear that it might change again or just that it doesn't feel right with you, then you absolutely do not have to. There is absolutely no need to give yourself a label if that is not something that feels right or feels comfortable to you. You can just be whatever and exist however you want to and that's okay. But if you do want a label and you feel comfortable with a label, then you can also do that and you can also change that at a later point if it doesn't feel comfortable to you anymore. The amount of people who are like bisexual and then realize later that they're like lesbians is, is pretty, it's pretty a lot. Don't feel like you have to choose one and stick with it forever. You can have no label or you can have several labels and they can change and they can grow and you can just have crushes on whoever you're gonna have a crush on and yeah, I hope that you don't overthink it too much. And I hope that you have people around you that support and accept you no matter who you have a crush on. Um, and sometimes you're gonna wanna kiss people and sometimes you're not gonna wanna kiss people. And that is a-okay. I'm an 18 year old trans girl, out to friends but closeted due to safety reasons in regard to transphobic family. I'll be headed to university this autumn and I guess I'm excited. I'll be able to safely start HRT and express myself authentically and all that but it still makes me really upset that I've gone through a really painful and honestly what's felt like a very isolating teenagehood and that I'll have to look back at what I'm going through now. At school and events, I felt so disengaged in everything, constantly dysphoric and just disassociating myself every moment because I could never truly live like a regular teenage girl. And it's felt like my entire youth was just taken from me despite the fact that I'm still pretty young. How can I move past this and just make a comfortable environment for myself as a person once I start university? I am incredibly sorry that this is something that you have experienced and gone through. I think this is something that is like rather prevalent among a lot of queer people, especially amongst trans people who obviously had to force themselves to present as a gender that did not reflect as who they are and had to live as someone so separate to who they actually feel that they are. And that is an incredibly difficult and horrible thing. And I am so sorry that you had to go through that and that you felt so alone in that. And I know that a lot of queer people in regards to like sexuality and things also go through that and like hiding parts of yourself and not being able to experience, you know, have the full teenage experience that so many other people are able to have and having that robbed from you. And I went through that in my own way as well. I was in a really terrible place when I was a teenager and I was in an abusive relationship and very, very depressed and did not, was just not a person for a period of time. And so I understand what you're going through in my own like slightly different sort of way. And I think that as you say, like you are still young there is still so much of life and you are not alone in this experience of having that like hollowness around your teenage years. You're gonna go into university and you are going to find your people. There are going to be other people at university who have gone through similar things, whether they be similar in the same way or similar in other ways. You're going to find a lot of queer people and a lot of people in other situations that may have taken their youth away from them who want to make up for that and experience that. And there's just something kind of special about finding that community and people who have experienced similar trauma and being able to relate to them and come together and like make up for lost time together. And although you're never going to be able to get that time back and it, it sucks and it's so horrible, Having people that you can experience things with for the first time and who love and accept you for who you are and who want to encourage and support you in these new adventures is something that is so special. And those friends are people that like, they just like become part of your soul, you know? Like having those relationships is something that is so magical and they are something that you will be able to find at university now that you're able to be yourself and express yourself and experience life outside of this fear and this bubble that you've been in. You'll get to discover and live all these things for the first time and like find people who you connect with and you're able to experience that with as well. And although it's not the same, you, you will be able to find that and it'll be really special. And I 
I'm excited for you to be able to experience some of these things for the first time. You can grieve and mourn the like youth that you lost while making new memories and honoring your inner child that didn't get to have those experiences. And I wish you the absolute best of luck for that. And I hope that you are able to go out and find a whole bunch of things that you love and want to experience for the first time. How do you tell the difference between romantic and platonic love? I have a friend that I really like and that I think I have or had a crush on, but whenever I think of kissing or having sex with her, I get squicked out. I've had this problem for a while and I'm not sure what to do about this. I've talked to her about it and she's in a relationship already so I obviously wouldn't do anything, but I've been struggling with these thoughts and have been feeling guilty for a while now. So any advice you can give me on the topic would be great. This is a very real struggle and I actually have so many emails asking this exact same question and I'm not gonna lie, this is also something that I experience myself as well. You want your partner to be your friend, right? Which makes it easier to like misinterpret those feelings. Like you, you wanna be friends with your partner. And I think that there's not really any way to like explain what's different between platonic and romantic love other than like you just kind of no, you kind of just, it feels different. I don't know how to explain it, but it's just different. Especially if you start off as friends and then you like develop a crush, you will be able to like tell the difference and the difference in the depth of that bond and your desires and wanting to kiss or have sex or anything of that nature does not necessarily come into play. There are plenty of asexual people who are in romantic relationships. You can be asexual and still have romantic desires. So those two things are not exclusive. Although I understand that that may make it more of a difficulty to be able to tell the two apart. But you can have romantic desires without sexual desires. And then occasionally you can act on those romantic desires and that will lead to sexual desires. But they aren't, you don't need to have both. You can have sexual desires and no romantic ones and you can have romantic ones with no sexual ones. Like, But platonic love, like friendship love should be involved with all of it, I think, you know, like you need to have that friendship connection along with the romantic connection. But obviously, yeah, that makes it a little bit difficult to be able to tell them apart. <laughs> I'm glad you talked to them about it. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, the only advice I can give for romantic versus platonic attraction is just that only you can tell, only you'll be able to know. And it can be a bit of a struggle and confusing, but I hope that you figure it out and I hope that you find someone whom you do connect with on that level, if that is something that you desire and that you're able to then be able to tell it apart a little bit more after having that connection with someone and being like, oh, that's what it is. <laughs> but I say just kind of compare how you feel about this friend compared to how you feel about your other friends and like search for the depth and the difference in it and see if you can try piece together what is different about it. Because like, it's so hard to put into words. I'm a trans man, but I'm very femme presenting. I'm currently dating a man who tends to ignore this fact. Despite my friends referring to me by my preferred name, he uses my birth name and I tend to allow it because my parents are not accepting and I do not want them to know. I'm afraid to broach the topic with him because I am afraid to ruin our relationship. Despite this rather glaring fact, he is very kind and a wonderful partner. I'm in my final year of school and I am just considering letting it fizzle out naturally when I leave the country to study abroad, but perhaps I should break it off before it becomes a serious relationship. Do you have any advice on whether I should wait it out or end it now? I am so sorry that your partner doesn't respect your identity and use your chosen name. That is a very glaring red flag. I think that saying he is a wonderful partner while he is disrespecting such a big part of your identity just doesn't really match up. Like I understand that he may be treating you very nicely in other ways and he may be respectful in other ways. However, if he is disrespecting your identity, he is not worth it. He is not a good person to have in your life. Disrespecting your identity and who you are and not acknowledging a massive part of yourself as in like your identity is not something you should be able to overlook. Like that is not something you should overlook and you should set your bar much higher because you deserve so much better than that. Like if he is being kind and like 
nice in other ways. I'm glad that he is doing that. You will be able to find that in someone else who also respects you as who you are within yourself, your name, your gender, your pronouns, etc. Like you will find someone who loves you with all of that and who is genuinely kind and wonderful. Please do not settle for anyone who is going to disrespect you and call you by the wrong name because that's just, it's really upsetting and really not okay at all. Um, I definitely do think that you should break it off before you go away. I think that you deserve someone that is so much better. And I think you need to explain that to him as well. If he is genuinely kind and a wonderful partner otherwise, if you broach the topic with him and say, hey, this is my identity and this is my name, please use it. And he has a problem with that. You're not ruining the relationship. You are just very much immediately finding out that he is not worth it and he is not respectful and a good partner and you should leave him in the ditch and never look back. But I mean, if you've already told him what your name and pronouns are, etc., and he is refusing to acknowledge that and use that, then just, just leave him behind. Just leave, just leave him behind, you know? Like, it's just not worth it. Find someone who respects you and loves you and all of you and is wonderful and kind. And I hope that studying abroad is fun. Maybe you'll meet someone cool there. Hello, I'm a 24 year old trans man and I've been struggling a lot with presentation. It's been a few years now, but I've never made any real progress in making my physical appearance match the way I actually see myself. I've always been very curvy and it's difficult to feel like I can look masculine when my body is almost always seen as distinctly feminine, at least with how my body is right now. Even when wearing my binder, it feels like because my hips are very wide that there's no chance of being recognized as anything but extremely feminine. It feels pointless trying sometimes and it feels like everyone is looking at me strangely when I do try to present closer to how I want to, especially when everyone is always nice to me any time that I present more femininely. I feel like when I present the way that is more comfortable for me that people look at me strangely. It makes me feel like I'm doing something wrong and then I just want to hide. Even when I wear clothes that are closer to what I want to wear, it never looks right on me with how my body is now. I just feel as though I look so much bigger when I dress that way, and as someone who has always struggled with body image issues, it's really difficult. I haven't bought new clothes in so long, and most of what I have is still pretty feminine because that's what this body looks best in, and I don't want to get new clothes until my body is closer to what feels right. Clothes are pretty expensive, especially as a whole new wardrobe and getting that now before my body is less excessively curvy feels wasteful when I'll likely have to get a new one not too long after. It leaves me in the conundrum of either dressing very femininely and constantly being misgendered but having people not treat me weirdly or dressing more masculine the way I really want to and feel like I look so big while people glare at me, but I actually feel comfortable in my body, at least as long as I don't look in the mirror more than a small bit, but that's a different issue. I just don't know what to do and constantly end up feeling like I'm trapped in this body that is more like a cage rather than my own body. It's hard to do anything that means I'd have to look at myself even in the way that you see yourself without mirrors or reflections, looking down and seeing your thighs or stomach, if that makes sense. I'm trying so hard, but it feels like there's never a right option. Thank you for reading this. If you do, any advice would be extremely appreciated. God, it's such a difficult and horrible situation. Bodies and the way we perceive ourselves and the way other people perceive us is such a frustrating and horrible thing to deal with. And my heart goes out to you completely because it is such a massive, massive struggle. I obviously do not have any experience in the field of gender dysphoria and not feeling like my body is my own for that reason. And I cannot imagine how difficult that must be and how hard it must be to have a body that looks so different to how it feels like your body should look. And then on top of that, having other body image issues as well. Like that is such a massive, massive load to be carrying. And when that's added with like the overall fear of people like looking at you and noticing people looking at you, I can imagine that being just like such an isolating and overwhelming feeling. Obviously the only part of that I can relate to is the body like dysmorphia and body image issues when it comes to that side of it. And that alone is already such a massive struggle. The only advice I'm able to give really is the advice that worked for me and what helped me 
overcome my body image issues. But again, I am aware that that is a completely different problem. So I don't know how well this works for your specific situation. Uh, but I personally think that, you know, comfort in your clothing choices and in your body definitely outweighs the way that people are interpreting you and looking at you. And I know that that is much, much easier said than done, but focusing on yourself and how you feel and knowing that your comfort is the priority and if other people have a problem with that, that is not your problem, that is their problem. My biggest advice to literally anything um, when it comes to most mental health stuff, honestly, that is so silly and that is way too simplified is always just fake it till you make it. And I know that doesn't work for everyone. And advice is not a one size fits all. Personally, for me, the things that always help me is do what feels uncomfortable and do it enough that it starts to feel comfortable. So like my eating disorder was really, really bad when I was a teenager. I really struggled with body image and confidence and I wanted to hide my body completely all the time. And I made a promise to myself and I still live by this now, um, that every time I felt like I needed to hide my body, that I was ashamed of my body and I didn't want to exist in my body because I didn't feel like my own and I felt trapped in it, I would show it. I would wear clothes that were more form fitting or I would post a photo on social media of me in my underwear kind of thing. And I just acknowledge the fact that like, this is my body, this is what it looks like and there's literally no problem with it. And I confronted myself with that and shared with other people that and like didn't let myself hide. And that is something that has consistently worked for me and has helped me build up a better relationship with my body after such a long time of, Feeling like it isn't my own, um, it's really just helped me connect with it. And again, I know this is a separate issue. And so showing your body is actually the opposite of what you wanna be doing here. So I suppose the version of it here that would apply is wearing clothes that you love and that you feel comfortable in, even though you know people are going to be looking at you and glaring at you and saying things about you because ultimately, your comfort and your confidence and your body and your fashion and all of that, that belongs to you. And other people shouldn't be able to take that away from you. And again, that is so much easier said than done. And I am so, so aware of that. And I know that this is all stuff that you probably tell yourself or other people have told you anyway. So I'm sorry if I'm not adding anything new to the conversation here. And I know that it's all well and good for me to sit here and say the way other people think about you and feel about you doesn't matter, but that doesn't change the way it feels when you see people having those reactions and also the fear that it can invoke because obviously being trans isn't always safe. So I can imagine that there's a lot of factors that go into this and I do hope that you are able to express yourself and feel comfortable and also feel safe. I hope you know that like I fully believe and encourage you to dress in clothes that make you feel good. I don't think there's any type of clothes that look particularly good for a certain body. That is all just made up stuff that we have been like brainwashed into thinking. Clothes that look good on specific bodies, that is all just made up. We've just been brainwashed into sort of thinking that things have to look a certain way on certain bodies and define your bodies in a certain way. But None of that really matters above your own comfortability, but also your safety. So I hope that you're able to find sort of this balance where you feel comfortable and confident and also safe. Have days where you play it safe and then days where you push yourself until those days where you push yourself feel more natural and less scary and practice those positive affirmations, you know? Again, they sound so silly, but like they genuinely do help of like wearing clothes that make you feel good and telling yourself that you look good and telling yourself that like other people don't care and that if people are looking at you, they're just jealous of how cool you look. Like just tell yourself that. 
remind yourself of it. And like, although it feels really, really silly at first, the more you say it to yourself, the more you genuinely do start to believe it. And I hope, I hope that this advice has been at least somewhat helpful. Again, it's not a struggle that I relate to in the same sense. So please anyone correct me if this advice is not applicable or very good. It's just the only advice that I can give based off of my own experience and knowledge that I have. So I'm a 19 year old girl who wants to be a singer and performer. The problem is I don't know where to start. I'm not entirely sure about how people get paid for their art or marketing or anything like that. I have a ton of different resources to use, Skillshare, possible colleges, the internet and YouTube, etc. I'm just not sure which ones will help me understand best, especially since some of them cost money and I don't wanna waste money on trying to learn something if it doesn't actually work. I have issues focusing, possible ADHD, I've never been tested, and need help with a therapist, but even trying to find one is difficult, which feels like a key aspect of figuring things out. Everything around me feels cluttered, which makes it harder for me to focus, whether it's trying to organize so I know where everything is, or I try to jump in head first and declutter throughout. This is especially prevalent in the fact that I have three accounts on both YouTube and Instagram, all of which involve different interests. Some accounts have friends, others have family, and some I've posted on while others don't even have a profile picture. Even if I knew how to start making videos, I wouldn't know which account to use and whether or not I should just ignore the others. I guess my questions would be, how do I get my life on track and start trying to get into performance? How were you able to start making music as well as start your YouTube channels and podcasts? And how were you able to declutter and find help despite having ADHD? I myself could have written this email. Honestly, every single part of this, like, hit so true <laughs> in my heart. Oh my God. These are all fantastic questions and things that I myself am still trying to figure out, right? Like I've been doing YouTube now for four years. Jesus. And I have not released music in that entire time. The last time I released a song was a couple months before I uploaded my first YouTube video. And even with that, I actually have a bunch of YouTube videos that I made that are now private, that I made before that, before I moved here. And then a few years before that, when I was like 15, I have more YouTube videos on a different channel that I uploaded then, as well as some old covers that are still there. And it is so hard to balance everything. Right now, my goal for this year, as my goal for last year was, is to finally make music again, because that is my actual passion and the thing that I actually love to do and want to do. And it is just so hard to get started and to start moving on that path. All it starts with is an email and it sounds so simple, but that that is what it is. It's emails. You have to send emails to people that you think will be able to help. So like with the music that I've previously released, I had connections because I went to university to study music and the people who produced my previous songs were people that had graduated in years before me. So I knew them through other students and I knew them through my vocal coach. And that is how I ended up working with them is I sent them emails and we sorted it out. I went and they helped me finish writing my songs and recording them. And then you just find a distributor and you release them through a distributor. It's actually quite an easy process. Um, if you can make the music yourself, you can easily just put it all on Spotify and such by yourself, but finding people to work with. So if you have an artist that you really like, you can go on to Spotify and find the producers, like the credits, and you can find them and email them. And a lot of the time they'll be willing to work with you. You just have to know that it can be quite pricey. So go for a smaller artist who is not going to use as much of an expensive producer. And that is one of the great things about studying music at uni. Like all of my friends from uni now produce their own music. I am not good at that myself. I did production <laughs> for like two years and I still can't fucking do it, but I know I could get my friends to help me out if I needed to. So, I think university is a great option in terms of making connections and meeting people who potentially can like help you for the long term when it comes to making music. You can learn a lot of stuff. You can meet a lot of people. Like everyone always says networking is a very important part of being in a creative field. Although I don't particularly utilize anything from uni so much anymore, it was very helpful at the time. And I know that I still could if I needed to. And as far as like, Instagram and YouTube and videos and stuff go. Oh, when I was a teenager, ran like seven different Instagram accounts, which is 
ridiculous. I was mainly active on, I think, four of them, but I get you, I feel you. In terms of making YouTube videos, if that is something that you are interested in and you want to do, you honestly don't need much to start. You just have to want to start. That's literally it. My first several videos on this channel, which are some of my most viewed videos on this channel, was just, I sat down in the spare bedroom of my auntie's house. I sat in just the sunlight and I put my phone on a chair, leaning against a book, and I just hit record. And they were front facing too, so I could see myself. So it's not even very good quality. And that was it. I just had my phone and some sunlight and iMovie. And that was all I did. And the things I talked about was just like, I watched some straight TikToks. That was pretty much it. If you have something to talk about, something that you want to do, you really don't need much to start. It does take both hard work and luck in order to make it happen. But like, unfortunately, when it comes to performance and everything, luck is such a massive, massive part of it. It sucks, but it, it, is, it is a large contributing factor. When it comes to music, I think the most important thing you have to realize is that like, yeah, connections and emails are your best friend because you can go to open mic nights, you can book gigs at pubs and bars and clubs and stuff relatively easy. Most of my friends do like tours around New Zealand just because they go and they send emails and they book in at like bars and then they'll play at bars. You pay like $200 to book out the venue and then people can buy tickets for like $10 and then you just have to sell 10 tickets and you've made back the money you used to like hire the bar. And then that slowly like works its way out and it's like a slow building thing when you do it that way. And then sometimes you just get lucky. Your song blows up on TikTok. You get like radio play after emailing a radio station. In New Zealand, it's much easier because it's a small place. so. It's quite easy to get on the radio. It's quite easy to do these things because it's not very many people. There's, the music industry is like four people big. So my advice holds everywhere else, but it is much harder to do everywhere else. And in terms of ADHD, uh, it's a real struggle. That is something I still struggle with a lot as well. Decluttering and sorting out your brain is so difficult. It's so, so hard. It, it, it's, it's so hard. And I think having a support person or support people is really helpful. If you just choose one task to do a day even and just go through it like so slowly like that, I find that really helpful. Don't overwhelm yourself by like looking at how many things you have to do. Start with an email and go from there sort it out by steps and and don't look at the last step. Just do the first one and don't think about any further. Just go literally one step at a time. Start with an email and then have some songs that you're writing and then work through it piece by piece as you go. That's really all you can do. I hope that that was helpful advice. That was I was talking for a long time. I am going to do one more. Okay, so a few days ago, I saw a post on my Twitter timeline and it said to contact my government for a ceasefire in Palestine. I tried looking to see if I could send a phone call or an email to my government in Sweden and how it works, but I haven't found any concrete answer as to if I can, as a minor, contact my government. I then tried telling my parents if they could contact them for me. They said that they can't, and since we don't have our citizenship yet, they said no, as they don't want something bad to happen surrounding it. For example, prolonging the waiting time for it or for our visa, since they can keep you waiting for two years. Of course, I know that anything will happen, but in our old country, it wouldn't be a surprise considering how corrupted the government is. I know that it's hard for them to get over that and the fear of not being able to speak up about anything if they don't wanna face consequences by the government. For example, my dad a few years ago, when he first started working at a music school, he went to a protest for a new president since ours is pretty shit, but after that, his paycheck went down significantly and we could barely afford anything after that. So I don't know what to do. I can't stand seeing the people of Palestine suffer, but I don't know if I can even do anything more about it except sharing and boosting on the internet, boycotting and educating the people I can. I can't even donate since all my money is being held by my parents and they won't give it to me until they see fit. So I don't know if this was a bit unnecessary or dumb, but I really don't know what I should do or who I should ask. So I'm grasping at straws, any advice? Now, this is something that I think is a conversation that we need to have. And that is just that the weight of the world is put onto the shoulders of teenagers. And it must be so, 
so difficult. Like it was hard when I was a teenager. I felt like there was a lot of pressure to be proactive and like get involved in activism when I was a teenager. And it has gotten like so much worse since then. And the amount of blame that is placed on their shoulders is like suffocating, you know? Like currently it's what? The world is ending, like climate change. That is something that teenagers feel like they have to take full responsibility for. And just any tragedies in the world and anything going on Because of the way social media works, there's so much like guilt tripping around it to which you end up with situations like this when there are children who feel as though they have to do something to end it or else they're a bad person. And I just need you to know that that, that's not true. It is not your burden to bear and it is not solely your responsibility to fix such massive, massive issues. Yes, it is so important to be talking about Palestine and it is important to be raising awareness and to be sharing and uplifting Palestinian voices. And everyone has a limit on how much they are able to do. And there is also a limit in general as to how much we as civilians are able to do. And especially as a teenager, none of this is your responsibility. You do not need to feel guilty about not being able to do more than you are. The whole thing is just do what you can. And of course, for a child, for a teenager, that is going to be much more limited, especially when you're in a situation in which your livelihood is on the line. Your individual inability to not be able to contact your government official isn't the end of the world. You do not have to feel guilty about that. You are doing what you can by spreading awareness, by retweeting, by even sharing donation links. Even if you are unable to donate yourself, you are doing your part. Participate in the boycotts, participate in protesting if and when you can. Just talk about it. Tell people about what's going on and more importantly, uplift the voices of Palestinian people as best as you can. If that is all you can do, that is enough. Please do not feel guilty about not being able to do more because sometimes you can't do more and the suffering of those people is not on your shoulders. It is the responsibility of Israel and all the governments who are funding and supporting them and all the corporations who are funding and supporting them. It is not your fault as an individual. And separate to this in general, like on Twitter, there is this weird like performativeness of it and like almost a competition where people just like to be like, I'm doing more than you, you aren't doing enough and just guilt tripping a lot of people who aren't able to do more. And there's, that's not helpful. <laughs> do what you can, where you can. That is all anyone can ask. Donate, share, raise awareness, protest, contact your government officials if you can. Do whatever you can do as an individual and do not hold that above other people's heads. Do not make other people feel bad about what they are and are not doing. Just, this is a group effort. This is an effort of everyone to try to make a big change and everyone has different limits and different capacities to what they're able to do. Please do not feel guilty for doing what you can. Anyway, um, with that, I think I'm going to end the video here. I hope that this was helpful in any way to anyone at all. Um, Don't forget to send me your wild parent stories to diakiwi at gmail.com. That is kiwi with a Q. I hope that you have enjoyed this one. Um, Don't forget to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. A massive thank you to my Sprout and Above patrons whose names are up on the screen right now. I appreciate you greatly. And a huge, huge thank you to my Kiwi Cat patrons. Bobby, Josh, Mandy, Ikazel, Jessica, Eldo, Danielle, Raven, Elias, Chris, and Amelia. I love and appreciate you so, so much. Thank you so much for joining. If anyone else would like to become a patron, you go to patreon.com slash savvycat. Click the top link in the description. For as little as one pound a month, you get my videos a day early, as well as podcasts a week early. And then for three pounds and up, you get things such as outtakes, bonus mini podcasts, live streams, vlogs, and more. Uh, don't forget to follow me on Instagram, the queer kiwi, and Twitter, that queer kiwi. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe. Keep fighting. I love you. Mwah. When you close your eyes, you replace the dark.
heart 